This bonus episode of the Agriculture Today podcast features one of three speakers at the 2019 Industrial Hemp Conference. The conference was held on May 22, 2019 in Pratt, Kansas. Links to the PowerPoint presentations of each of the three speakers can be found in the show notes of their respective episodes. In this episode, Barry Grisson offers a look at the past, present, and future of hemp. Grisson focuses on the history and the challenges for the new hemp market. Regulation, chain of commerce, and product development are but a few of the new challenges facing this emerging market. Here's Barry Grisson. You know, it's probably tough to get back in the fields with all the rain we've had. Uh, It might account for a few folks, but I think this shows how much interest there is in the area of hemp. And what I wanted to do today was kind of talk to you a little bit about where we've come from, where we are, and I think where we're going to be going, uh, issues surrounding hemp. And I don't use the word industrial hemp, it's just hemp. Well, who am I? Well, first of all, um, I'm a lawyer. I uh, haven't spent a lot of time on tractors. I did as a kid with my, with my grandfather's farm in Kentucky where he grew tobacco. But I've spent my time, uh, my professional career as an attorney. I served, as uh, Frank said, here in the District of Kansas. I was the United States Attorney under President Obama from 2010 until 2016. So you kind of have to ask yourself, how is it that someone who was the top federal prosecutor is now involved in issues surrounding some forms of cannabis. Well, when I left the Department of Justice, I thought what little notoriety I might have as a U.S. attorney, uh, I was a firm believer and I remain a firm believer that cannabis prohibition in all forms is bad public policy. It is a waste of our taxpayer money. Uh, Thank you, Mom. Uh, 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 And I think each state, it's a classic Tenth Amendment constitutional argument. This is a right that should be reserved to each state as to how they want to uh, make decisions uh, concerning the use of cannabis. Uh, So I took that notoriety and I did some pro bono lobbying on the Hill concerning uh, sentencing guidelines when people who have been convicted, uh, as my office did, and we convicted lots and lots of folks involved in this universe, whether they were trying to grow hemp, because as we all know, or you may not know, hemp, until the Farm Bill, was lumped into just a the very simplistic definition of marijuana. And marijuana is still, a, uh, on the Federal Control Substance Act, it is a Schedule I drug right next to heroin. As silly as that sounds today, but it's right next to heroin. So you can still be convicted of, uh, you know, they talk about a field being too hot. But if you're in a jurisdiction where you have a very aggressive United States attorney, they may say, you know what, it, it's too hot because you want it to be too hot. What you're doing is you're growing plants that have high THC content, and you want to sell that, and we don't do that in this state. So under federal law, since you're involved with six or seven other folks, that's a conspiracy. That means you all get to go to prison for 10 years. That's bad public policy. So I'm so glad that we've evolving from the notion that uh, cannabis in different forms is somehow evil. Uh, It is uh, uh, something that each state should be able to control, make its own decisions uh, for or against, but that should be left to each one of us. You know, hemp has a long history. Everybody recognizes this, Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence is written on hemp. Not pulp from trees, but on hemp, as is our Constitution. It was back during that time, uh, that was a mainstay for paper products. Uh, uh, On any farm, uh, one of your crops that you grew was hemp. And that was so that you could do things like make rope, that you could make different kind of fabric 
from uh, hemp. I mean, uh, you know, even these guys grew hemp. Matter of fact, Jefferson is noted to have smoked hemp on his back porch looking down from Monticello. But uh, it was a very common practice to have hemp as part of um, uh, your um, efforts in agriculture. As I said, we have moved away uh, with the Farm Bill. We stripped out hemp from being lumped in with cannabis. And as our good friend Bobby Dillon says, you know, the times are changing. I mean, can you imagine five years ago, this many people be sitting in a room, talk about growing something that is still, or was until the Farm Bill, a Schedule I drug under the, uh, under the uh, federal drug enforcement laws. So we have come a long way, to be sure. And that moment in our history was the 2018 Farm Bill, passed with uh, the Herculean efforts of uh, Pat Roberts and Debbie Stabenow from Michigan, both uh, leaders in our Senate. Uh, in this day and age, when we talk about everybody fighting one another, the Farm Bill was a bipartisan piece of legislation that members of the House and members of the Senate realized how important agriculture is to our overall economy in our country and they put away a lot of the spatting and the kinds of stuff we see on TV and they sat down and they crafted what I think most folks believe overall is good public policy for farming communities. It's now considered to be a, 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 a agricultural product. I think as time goes on and we have the rules and regulations in place in different states, it will be just a commodity, like corn, like wheat, like cotton. It also permits on um, Native American land for there to be growing hemp. Um, you know, a lot of folks, uh, we, we have four Indian tribes in Kansas, we don't have quite the large land usage by those tribes that we have in other states where in Indian country states like North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, California, North Carolina, places like that, Oklahoma. Uh, and those are considered sovereign nations still under our law. So we, we had to, under the Farm Bill, we had to craft legislation that addressed issues with Indian tribes. Otherwise, they would get crosswise with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that was really important for uh, regulation on native tribes. Uh, the rules and regs that are being promulgated uh, now, and, and, and as we heard from uh, before, the professor was talking about Kentucky making its uh, information known to the USDA so we can finally get the overall uh, plans in place. It includes everything from tracking land use for cultivation, it's proving uh, testing methods, uh, disposal of plants or plant products that exceed THC concentrations. And that's a real big, a real big issue, and I'm, and I'm glad that that was in the last presentation that was brought up. Think about investing in and planting and nurturing your crop of hemp, and it's tested above 3%, 0 0.03. Uh, it's going to be destroyed. You're, you're going to lose that crop. Matter of fact, I think, uh, and the folks that I work with, uh, I think, uh, you know, we talk about growing hemp. Everybody wants to be a successful hemp farmer. What next? And some of the folks that we deal with, uh, you know, you all heard the old saying that uh, the, the people who made the money during the gold rush wasn't the miners, but it was the people who sold them picks and shovels. The same is true in, in, in the hemp universe. Folks who are going to make a lot of money in, in this area are going to be testing. You're going to have to have that. You're going to have to have your crop tested. Somebody's going to have to do that. Somebody, you're going to pay someone to do that. You know, um, you know, different kind of products that are going to come out of hemp other than just what we normally think of. Right now, we have 38 states considering legislation relating to industrial hemp since 2018. We, look, fortunately, are one of those states. We have our, as you heard before, we have our, our pilot programs that uh, we're involved in. Some states still 
do not allow cultivation, I think that that's going to change within this next year to two years. I think the whole issue of cannabis prohibition, if it doesn't change within the next year, in the 2020 uh, presidential race, in the 2020 race for House seats, for Senate seats, it'll be an issue I think that folks will be looking to. Remarkably, uh, after the last election, uh, Fox did an exit poll of Kansas voters on different issues, and one of them was whether or not there should be a doing away with prohibition, like they have in Colorado. 64% of our, our, our citizens said that's what they believe, and I think that surprised a lot of people. So there is, there is again, things are, things are changing. These are the Kansas statutes. You know, if you're a lawyer, just like the professor said, if you're a professor, you've got to show some chemistry up there. If you're a lawyer, you've got to talk about some statutes. These are the statutes that create the alternative uh, crop research uh, that we're doing here in the state. Um, we were just talking over at the table over here. I think by, hopefully by 2020, we'll be able to put a, a meaningful crop into the ground and uh, move forward from there. But the regulation part is still ongoing. The folks at the, the Ag Department are doing a great job. They're running as fast as they can with their folks. But it's going to take time. And we're going to have to go back to the legislature to have some more definition put into the process than, than exists right now. Well, here's what it's all about. You grow this crop, why are you growing it? Well, you're growing it because you want to have a source of income. Global hemp retail sales in 2018, and remember, we're not even really into the mix yet in our country, was $3.7 billion, and it's on track to grow to four, excuse me, $5.7 billion by 2020. Right now, we've got a, a billion dollars worth of sales uh, here in the States. Uh, it's only going to be growing. Uh, half of what we're doing right now is hemp-derived CBD products. CBD right now is that shiny object everybody's reaching for. And, and as the professor pointed out, that wheel of, you know, it, it's supposed to do everything from, you know, cure cancer to clean your dishes. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's all over the map. And I think one of the reasons why that is, and remember, because marijuana is still a Schedule I drug, nationally, we haven't, up until the Farm Bill, we haven't had the opportunity to do the kind of research to see, uh, you know, what are the real uh, uh, positive aspects of CBD? Or can we just go around and just say all these things uh, without uh, any kind of backing? Up until the Farm Bill, the only place in the country that was doing research was the University of Mississippi on cannabis products. So we're really, uh, not only we're trying to put together the rules and regs so that you can put a crop in the ground, but we're also trying to put together what are the, what are the effects of like CBD. You know, if you go right now, uh, I was in Wichita yesterday, I drove by several, you know, CBD stores. They're, they're popping up like mushrooms after big rain. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. And some of those folks are saying things, like we're on that wheel, that they cure things. Well, they will get a letter from the FDA that says, you, you can't make that kind of comment, you can't say that to sell your product, that it cures anything, because the FDA has not issued any kind of rules or regs that says there's been adequate testing, and that that testing shows that CBD uh, addresses anxiety, or addresses any of these other issues that are out there. Uh, I, right now, most of the information concerning CBD is very anecdotal at best. So, uh, if, if your, your grandmother says, it really helps me when I put it on my knees, you know, God bless her, you know, I hope it does. Uh, if she thinks it does, it, that's great. But as yet, there is no scientific evidence that says CBD does all the things that you saw in, in that wheel. Uh, so that, that's, that's an area that's, that's still growing. But you're seeing these CBD shops pop up everywhere. So from a standpoint of, you growing product in the field, 
right now, the quickest place to take it is going to be uh, to, to do some form of CBD product. Right now, the leading producer uh, is, is Canada. Canada is a leading producer of, of hemp, uh, as well as uh, China is also becoming a, a large producer of hemp. I was just commenting a few moments ago to some folks. I spoke six weeks ago uh, in Mexico to a thing called Cana Mexico. And uh, the Mexican government is, they have legalized marijuana, at, 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 at the entire uh, family of marijuana plants. And they've done that because they want to take it out of the portfolio of the criminals. If you can go down and buy it, you know, why go to organized crime to buy it? It's very smart public policy. But a big chunk of that is uh, providing Mexican farmers an opportunity to grow hemp and that they can be a world leader in hemp for uh, more than just CBD, you know, for, for bioplastics, for um, uh, uh, fabric, uh, for plastics, all those kinds of things. So the rest of the world is getting on board with this, and we're a little behind right now. So I think over the next few years, once we have our regulations in place, we'll be catching up with those folks. Right now, it shows you the amount where Canada is, China. We're fourth right now in line, but European countries, you can see those there. European countries are developing uh, hemp because uh, as part of the European Union, they are uh, believers in the fact that global warming is a real thing, and they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint. So in lots of uh, productions, they've mandated that 10% of anything that you produce that requires an element of plastic in it, and plastic, as we all know, comes from petroleum, a, 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 which increases your carbon footprint, 10% of that has to come from hemp oil. These are traditional uses. You always think about you know, using it as fiber, paper, rope, you know, uh, uh, animal bedding. But it it's also can be used as, 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 as food. Uh, everything can be uh, eaten raw, can ground into hemp meal. They're used in salads. It, it has a high uh, protein uh, factor. So, again, as the rules are promulgated and people start to grow more crop, there's going to be more and more ancillary uses than we typically think of. But here's what I think is really exciting for you, is the future of hemp. Uh, has anybody ever heard of hempcrete? Okay. It's amazing. It is something that they're using right now. It's a great insulatory uh, pro product. It's great for moisture. You know, sometimes you have issues with, in, in your basement. A lot of rain we've seen lately of what happens to our concrete basements. Um, they also have, and we didn't list it up here, they've also created a hemp fiber board that is uh, stronger than wood, a wood product. And the great thing about hemp, when we think about wood or pulp, is that you don't have to wait 8, 10, 12 years for trees to mature. This is a one-year operation that can be used uh, everything from you know, biofuels to building materials. Uh, going back to plastics, Audi, BMW, Ford, GM, Chrysler, Honda, Lotus, Mercedes, uh, uh, Por uh, Porsche, Mitsubishi, Saturn, Volkswagen, they all use hemp products. If they are produced in Europe, and you go and you buy yourself a C-Class Mercedes-Benz, the plastic in the door is from hemp oil, not petroleum. Another thing that is a, a positive about hemp is, it is a, it's a uh, wonderful plant for pulling CO2 and impurities out of the air, which again will help with issues surrounding uh, climate change. It's often used as a, a mop crop. They actually, in Chernobyl, they have planted large tracts of hemp plants in, in, in Russia where they had the, the, the uh, uh, disaster at Chernobyl when their nuclear reactors you know, uh, melted down. 
Uh, it, ha- it has an absorption process that helps purify uh, the areas around Chernobyl. Again, biofuels, and this, and this is also a big thing when we were in Cana, Mexico, with uh, uh, President Vicente Fox is, is really uh, t- turned into or tuned in on, is the issue of, of biofuels that can be made from the stalks uh, and, and hemp seeds. And that's another great thing about the hemp plant itself. There are so many different uses. Uh, you, you actually have very little waste. I mean, it, you can use the stalk for biofuel. Uh, there's uh, and all the other issues that we've we've, we've spoken about. It can be uh, alcohol fuel can be fermented with a plant, uh, so that you have another fuel base uh, to turn to. I, for one, think that this is something that is going to uh, revolutionize agriculture in our country. It's going to give. Uh, folks in agriculture, a, a, an option so that, quite frankly, we won't find ourselves in issues, uh, in being victims in trade wars. I mean, this is, this is something that we can make as a, a self-sustaining product that's going to help us in all those different endeavors, everything from the automotive industry to if we do research and we show that there are attributes that uh, CBD can help us with in health, there's all kinds of possibilities right now. Uh, all the, big Pharma is incredibly interested in uh, what kind of possibilities there are to use uh, hemp as well as other cannabis products uh, as, as, a med- as medicine. How, how can they use, be used in, in that capacity? I mean, something as simple as, it's not simple, but in states where uh, medical cannabis is readily available the very first year, opioid use decreases by 25%. And we think about the opioid crisis in our country and how much money we are spending on investigation, interdiction, arrest, prosecution, and incarceration of people who are addicted to opioids, the things that they have to go to to feed their addiction. Again, it's bad public policy if we have a reason and a mechanism there to help address someone's pain management so they do not find themselves being addicted to opioids, uh, then we should do that. We think about our our veterans, somebody who's been deployed two, three, four times and suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, And and he or she comes back and they don't want to take psychotropic drugs. They don't want to just be a blob laying on a couch. They want to have an option. Well, let's find out if hemp can help them. Let's find out if uh, THC-based cannabis can help them. There's evidence that it does. But here's the problem. If you're that veteran, and you're at Fort Riley, or you're at McConnell Air Force Base, or you're at Fort Leavenworth, and you drive to Colorado, or you drive soon to Missouri, or to Oklahoma, and you come back and you're stopped, you run the risk of losing all of your veteran benefits. If we have an option to treat and to honor our brave veterans, we shouldn't put them at risk of losing the very benefits that they justly uh, deserve. So. I'm excited by what's, uh, what's ahead of us. I think uh, uh, this community, other communities across Kansas, uh, from an ag standpoint, that this is a huge opportunity. Uh, your being here today shows the interest that you have in this area. Uh, I hope that we all get together again in four years. We're all talking about the successes that you've had. We're talking about the businesses that have kind of a parasitic fashion, grown up in a community, the testing facility, the John Deere or the, uh, I, or the Case IH implement dealer that has this new mechanism that you can put on your combine to harvest uh, hemp. So if there are any questions that you have of me, I'm going to be available after this. But again, what you're doing, and I don't, I don't want this to, I don't want just to, to, be, to understate this, What you're doing by being here today to look at this, in my estimation, is patriotic. It's patriotic because of all the 
industries, any economies that you're going to be able to affect as you move forward and the regulations are in place and we can finally have uh, an economy that is growing and we're not at anyone else's as peril as far as grabbing and saying you can't do that. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. This has been a bonus episode of the Agriculture Today podcast. Agriculture Today is produced each weekday, holidays excluded. To listen to the latest episode or subscribe, visit agtoday.net. Agriculture Today is produced by the News Media Services Unit of the Department of Communications and Agricultural Education in the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University.